<clears throat> All righty, Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, gift of prophecy or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. You know what I'm saying? And say hello to the studio audience that is not here. You know what I'm talking about? Um, I guess we should do announcements. You know what I'm saying? So if y'all want to join us for um, our, uh, what are we calling it? Our fellowship hour. It's really like fellowship five hours lately. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, our fellowship hour, you know what I'm saying? We do it every Sabbath day um, at 4 p.m. That's Pacific time. So that would be Saturday, Pacific time, 4 p.m. Um, you can join us if you need the link. Reach out to me. Um, and then what's our other announcement? Oh, and then we have uh, we have like a little community chat that we want to have for the people that, that watch consistently or that, you know what I'm saying, want want to be able to fellowship throughout the week. Uh, you can reach out for that link as well, and I'll send it over. Um, other than that, let's get at least four hours. Yes, as Pam said, at least four hours for sure. Um, let's get right to it, though. We have some good discussions on there, though. Some good discussions, you know what I'm saying? Got to stretch and pull and twist, you know what I'm saying? That's how this stuff, all this stuff got to be agitated. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Grab uh real quick, grab, grab um uh not Nahum. Who who I'm looking for? Not Nahum. About what? What are you talking about? Um uh, honestly, I can't even think of it. I'm thinking about clothes. Uh Zephaniah. Who? Zephaniah. No, nah, not Zephaniah. It is. It's clothes. No, nah, that's not Zephaniah. I'm not thinking about Zephaniah. I'm thinking about uh uh why I can't? Wow. What, what, uh, what are you? What are you? What's in you? What are you thinking about? Like, what's the theme? Like, what? What are you, what are you going? What's the book before uh, uh, Zechariah? That would be Malachi. But well, that's after Zechariah. Uh, I don't know. Let me look. That's a good question. Mike, uh, no. Is it before Zechariah? Yeah, before Zechariah. Yeah, guy. Haggai, that's who I'm looking for. Give me Haggai chapter uh, two. Haggai chapter two. Give me verse. Uh, uh, Haggai chapter two. Give me verse. Uh, what I want nine. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than than of the former, saith Yahuwah. And is the place will I give peace, says Yahuwah of hosts. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, the second year, Darius came. The word of the Lord by God, a prophet saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask now the priest concerning. Go to the part where he say, uh, where he asked the priest. You know what I mean? He tell him, ask the priest. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is it here. This is it. What here. verse is it? Uh, like 12. We'll say 11. 11? So give me give me Haggai chapter 2, verse 11. Watch what, you know what I'm saying? Watch, watch what the book says. It's important because we got to agitate this stuff. When we when we on this, on, on this uh, fellowship call, we agitate. And that's what this is. Right, it's agitating. We shaking stuff off of us. Watch this. Uh, this is uh Haggai <laughs> chapter two, verse twelve, verse eleven. Watch the book say. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, mm -hmm. dirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? Right? He said, Look, if somebody got holy flesh in the skirt of his garment. So I'm carrying what I'm doing is I'm carrying my garment, right? I'm carrying with my garment, holy flesh. In other words, this was meat that was uh, that was sacrificed and it's meant only for the priests. Right. This is holy meat It's set apart meat. So not everybody can touch this meat. This is set apart meat. It's meant only for 
the priest. He said, if you have it and you hold it, right? And you holding it in the skirt of your garment, right? And then after that, you do what? <clears throat> and do touch bread. And with his skirt, do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat. Shall it be holy? Right? You got grocery bags sitting on the darn table, but you carrying this holy meat in the skirt of your garment. Then all of a sudden, your whole your skirt kind of touch, you know what I'm saying, something that's in your grocery bag. It's saying, does it by merely touching that grocery bag make the grocery bag holy? Does it make the grocery bag set apart? Right? Let's see what the priest said. And the priest answered and said, no. Right? They unequivocally said, no, it does not. Just because something is holy and it touched something that was not holy does not make that not holy thing holy. It does not cause it to be set apart. Right? But watch the other way around. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? If you take the same scenario, but I'm now unclean by a dead body, according to our law, we ask the priest, if I'm unclean by the dead body, I walk through the same kitchen, it's the same grocery sitting on the counter, and I rub one of those groceries. I just touched the dead body, I'm unclean. Does it then make those groceries unclean that I touch? What does the priest say? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. The book say it's going to be unclean. So that goes to show us we have to get this stuff off of us. Right? We got to shake some of this stuff off. And the only way to shake it off is to agitate. Because us having unclean doctrine in us, having unclean understanding in us, us having all these different things in us, it prevents us from becoming clean. You can't just you can't just hear good doctrine and then be clean just because you heard it. No, you have to shake stuff off of you and then you can become clean. Not because something just touched you, not just because you heard something, because the most high God has caused you to be clean. He makes us clean by removing uncleanness from us. That's his promise to us. Right? It's good that we had these discussions, right? That's that's what that's what it's here for. I appreciate the sister for even coming up with the idea, right? Because through this process, now we can shake some of this stuff off. We can agitate, agitate. You kind of like got got like a washer and dryer, you know what I'm saying? And then your washer and dryer, what it do is it shake back and forth, you know what I'm saying? Shake back and forth, and sometimes it got a little thing, the agitator in the middle, and what that does is that causes friction, and the friction. When it shakes, it rubs the dirt, you know what I'm saying, off of the clothes. And it keeps going, it keeps going until all the dirt is rubbed off of the clothes. And then you shake it off, and you got clean clothes because the dirt has been rubbed off of it. Right? When the Most High God cleans us, what does he do? When we have a bottle of Lysol and we spray it, what does it say on the bottle? Kill germs. How many are the germs? 99.999. They say, I almost killed all of them. Right? That's what it say. It say, I killed the germs. By killing the germs, you remove the unclean. That's the same thing that, that Yahushua does for us. He removes the unclean for us. You don't get made clean just because something clean touches you. You get made clean when you remove what's unclean. That's why something that's unclean can make something that uh, make something that's clean unclean, but something that's clean can't make something that's unclean clean. Because it's a process of removing. To be clean, you have to remove. So that's what we look for. That should be our goal when we talk. That should be our goal in life, period. How do I remove anything that's not like God from me? How do I press forward? How would I put my face towards the man and just keep walking? How do I shake all this foolishness off of me? Right? Because that's what happens. These people, listen, 
you can't you can't put all this you can't put all this pressure on yourself to look at yourself and be like, oh, I should have known. I should how you should have known? How you supposed to know when you grew up in a Christian church lying to you? How you supposed to know? How you supposed to know we don't have not one? I can't point to a me personally. I can't per, point to one leader outside of a, 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 a brother that I have in Dallas that teach the people to what I would consider appropriate. All these people teaching false doctrine and teaching us wrong. And we got to jump from one teacher to the next teacher to try to figure this out. Of course, we're going to be confused. Of course, none of us, including me, is going to have it right uh, immediately. That don't make no darn sense. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even make sense if, if that was the case. We got to get this stuff. We got to get this stuff in us. And then we got to remove all this other stuff from us. We got to challenge everything that's in us. And we got to anchor ourselves and tie ourselves to the book. Grab a, oh, oh, uh, grab a, what is it? Romans, uh, what do I want? Romans 5? Give me Romans 5. Give me verse 9. <clears throat> much more than being now justified by his blood we should be saved from wrath through him no nah, that's uh romans oh no not sorry give me first peter first peter 4 11 not not romans first peter 4 11 is what i want This first Peter chapter four, verse 11. If any man speak, <clears throat> let him speak as the oracles of God. He if said, any if man, any man speak, let him do what? Let him speak as the oracles of God. When the book say oracles, it's talking about it's talking about the word. We have to anchor ourselves according to the word. When he's, when he's saying this, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. He's saying, make sure you tie down everything that you're saying, everything that you believe to the word of the most high God. That's how we get rid of this stuff. We don't just make ourselves clean just because it's easy. And we like, you know what, God? Oh, I'm around your word and I'm listening to somebody who teach your word and I'm reading your Bible every day. Therefore, I'm clean. That's not how the book works. That's not what you you never read that in the book. You get clean by removing stuff from you. This is the hard part. This is the tough that you got to. This is the part that you got to tough through that you got to you got to sit through. You got this is the part when people get agitated it's where they want to give up. The suit. That's the hard part. The hard part is sorting through. What I thought was real, what I think is fake, what don't seem like it's real, what don't seem like it's fake, sorting through all this stuff and then making sense of it and letting the most high God move. But you got to trust him and you got to tie everything you do to the word. If it ain't tied to the word, then it's up for grabs. Anybody can have it. This, that's where, listen, anything not, not tied to the word, that's where Satan works. That's where he play at. Right? Tie it to the book. That's the only way we, we get through in this, this wicked generation. We in a wicked generation. These people be lying. Right? People be lying. And they lie so good, of course we gonna believe some of it. Of course that stuff gonna still feel like it makes sense to us. We can't be, we can't be so prideful in ourselves that we think that we can't be deceived. That's crazy. This man been deceiving people since the beginning. Literally, since the beginning, he's been deceiving people. And all of a sudden, we think we too good. We can't be, de be deceived. We've been tri tricked by girlfriends, boyfriends, governments, teachers, you know what I'm saying, jobs. All these people be tricking us, and we know it. Like, dang, I can't believe it. You know what I'm saying? All these advertisements get it. Like, really? If I click right here, you mean you'll send me two of the blow-up mattresses? And then we get to clicking on it. Now we got a darn virus. 
They got this thing going around right now where they send it. It got me busy at work. They sending text messages. You know what I'm saying? Sending text messages to people saying it's USPS. And people who deliver and they think they're waiting on the package, it make them think, oh, okay, I got to click on this text message. And then it asks them to just pay $1. Load up your credit card, put $1. After you put that thing in, they then took over your phone. They logging into your bank account. They clearing your stuff out, spending all your little money. We fall for this type of silly stuff. Then we got the nerve to stand up and be like, oh, Satan, get behind me. You better shut your darn mouth. You ain't ready for this, man. Say no. Wear your butt out. Trying to figure out how you feel like you can get Satan and you can't even, you can't even get past the USPS text message. Now you got PayPal charges all over your darn phone. You looking like, I didn't do that. Let me call Chase. Right? We got to be conscious of this stuff. What we talked about last week. <coughs> talked about uh, my man, uh, what's my man's name? Was it Manasseh, I think? Yeah, King Manasseh, right? Let's look up on the screen, right? So let's look at, uh, we had King Manasseh that, th that we were dealing with. All right, so let's look here. Let me get my little laser pointer. All right. So we got past King Hezekiah. Then we got his son, King Manasseh, that came in. You remember King Manasseh was wilding out, going crazy, right? Doing the most King Manasseh was. He started just rebelling against everything. He did worse than even the kings of Israel and all the kings that were before him, right? Then after that, most of our God was like, all right, for sure. Then the king of Babylon came and grabbed him up. Took him on fetters. You know what I'm saying? In other words, like pierced his, pierced his skin and pulled him with hooks. You know what I'm saying? And pulled him all the way into Babylon. Right? And when he pulled him into Babylon, he put him in prison. And there Manasseh started praying. Right? Manasseh was like, nah, man, if you just get me out of here, man, I'll be all right. Most high God honored him. He got him out of there. Manasseh, he, what did he do? He repented. We learned in Chronicles. It didn't tell us about it in Kings, but in Chronicles, it told us that he repented. Right. Then he started tearing down all the groves and tried to clean up as much as he could. He didn't clean up everything, but he tried to clean up as much as he could. You know what I'm saying? Until until he didn't die. Right. So we learned about Manasseh. Manasseh ended up dying, but Manasseh had a son and Manasseh's son. His name was Ammon. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to read about now is Ammon. But let's go to. Uh, let's go to. Uh, Second Chronicles. Give me verse. Where we leave off? Uh, we were thirty three. I think we finished thirty three. No, we was in the middle of thirty three on verse twenty. Let me get uh first uh second Kings. I mean, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles, chapter. You said thirty three. Thirty three twenty. Second Chronicles, chapter thirty three, verse twenty. Watch what the book say. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. And Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. <clears throat> and Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah, as did Manasseh, his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto the carved images which Manasseh, his father, had made, and served them. And humbled not himself before Yahuwah. As Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. And his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. And mm -hmm. the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in, in his stead. Right. So then Ammon <clears throat> got in and then there were people that conspired against him and killed him. So Ammon just started doing the most. He started, he started kind of following out the Man Manasseh before he repented. Right. And then some people got in and they ended up killing Ammon. Then the people of the land killed the people that killed Ammon. So Ammon had, you know, said a relatively short kingdom. And then you had Josiah that ended up taking over. Let's keep going. That's chapter 34. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. 
Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Right? So now this is Josiah. And Josiah handled things correctly, right? And he didn't he didn't turn to the left or to the right. He started at eight years old and ended up ruling for 31 years. It's important. It's a lot to cover with Josiah. Let's let's get into it. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. They break down the altars of Baalim in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut down, he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. <clears throat> And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even up to Naphtali, with their with their mat with their mattocks round about. When he had broken down the altars and the groves, and he had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now, in the eighteenth year of his reign, when he had purged the land, and the house he sent he sent Saphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Jeho Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of Yahuwah, his God. When they right? So notice what he did. First, he tried to clean the land up. Right? He went through and he started burning up all the altars, clearing that stuff up. Right? Y'all probably forgot, but let's go back to... Uh, Let's let's hold what we got there. Let's go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. Let's see if y'all remember this. Sister Pamela, no, I don't know if that's the youngest king. Right? I think uh Manasseh might have started at 8 too. Uh, what's the name? Was six. Uh, what's, uh I think Isaiah, when he grew up, when the priest raised him. When he was younger than six. When Athaliah was uh Running around, wilding out, and the priest. Yeah, he was younger than he was younger than six. He was younger than six. Yeah, uh, he was just a little baby. Yeah, that would be that would have been the youngest king. Uh, Joash. Yeah, Joash, not Isaiah. Yeah, Joash would have been the youngest king, but uh, I want to say I want to say Manasseh started at eight too. I think or mm -hmm. it wasn't Hezekiah. I want to say Manasseh started at eight. <laughs> And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Y'all remember the man of God that came out to see Jeroboam? Remember Jeroboam first? This is Jeroboam. He, he was the first king of the northern uh, tribes after uh, Solomon. Right? When the Most High God split it, he split it from, from, from Solomon to uh, Jeroboam. Then when Solomon died, Jeroboam, he started to take over. Right? Watch this. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Yahuwah and said, O altar, altar, thus says Yahuwah, Behold, Watch this. thou shalt be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And he said, who going to be born? Josiah by name. Go back again. He said, who going to be born? And he cried against the altar and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. He said, a child is going to be born unto the house of David. His name is going to be Josiah. And what is he going to do? And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. He said, he's talking to the, he's talking to the altar. He said, upon you, altar, you're going to have men's burnt bones burnt on you. Just like an offering. All these false priests that keep burning incense and burning offering at the wrong altar. Right? This is something that a man of God came and told Jeroboam years ago. Hundreds of years ago. Right? If we go back to our little timeline here. Here, I ain't even got to pull it up on the thing. Y'all can see it here. If we go back to the timeline here. 
Right? We way over here. Right? You look at this. This prophecy happened way back here. Right? So that means we had to go through all of this time. Right? And get all the way down here. Right? Hundreds of years ago, this was said. Nevertheless, we might have forgot. Guess who didn't? You know what I'm saying? Most High God didn't forget. <coughs> Most High God didn't forget. Everything that the Most High God say is going to come to pass one way or another. We might even think like, oh, okay. Most High God said it and then he repented of it. You might think he repented of it. It's still going to come to pass. Remember we talked about uh, Jonah? When Jonah, he was like, man, I knew, I knew if I told these people, you would repent of it. Jonah went to Nineveh, right? Yeah. He went to Nineveh. He spoke to them people. They all repented. So then God repented of what he was going to do to those people, right? Then after that, Nineveh became, a, you know, the, the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire just got taken out by Babylon. So it still happens. And it happens the way the Most High God said it was going to happen. It just may not happen at the timing that we think. The man of God was walking up, looking at the, uh, looking at the, uh, the altar, and he talking to the altar like, man, look, this is going to be somebody born in the house of David. His name going to be Josiah. He going to burn up these altars. And people's bones going to be burned on them too. And we might look at that like, yeah, man, the guy was probably looking at that like, man, I can't wait till this happen. I hope it happened next week. Hundreds of years pass. The northern kingdom ain't even there no more. You know what I'm saying? Like the descendants of Josiah, the brethren of Josiah, uh, not Josiah, the, the uh, descendants of Jeroboam and the brethren of Jeroboam ain't even there no more. His whole family didn't die. There's the other people that took over kings and kings after them and kings after them. They family died. All types of stuff didn't happen. They now they taking they not even in the land no more. Now you got Gentiles in the land. And guess what? Most our God still did it exactly how he said he was going to do it. Right? Sometimes we forget. We forget. Most our God don't forget. That's why you got to pay attention to the word. I try to tell y'all the book. The, Most our God is very technical. Right? He's not all this stuff that we do is loosey goosey. Right. We just we just on some like, oh, well, I kind of like I kind of feel like it look and it feel and it seem and this, that and other. We got to look at the when when the man say something, we may not know how it's going to play out, but we got to look at that. I even talk to people about Re revelations. Sometimes people about revelation like, no, nah, see, when it's a dragon, brother, the dragon is really an empire. You know what I'm saying? The dragon and the heads of the dragon represent. I'm like, yeah, I understand because, you know, that's kind of how the prophecy break it down to us. But at the same time, don't be surprised if you see a big old dragon. You know what I mean? Like, I leave, you got to leave your mind open because the most high guy, you think he playing. You will think he's joking about this stuff. You think it's not a big deal. The man is technical. The man is not playing with us. He'll make that thing happen the way he want. You get to set in your mind like, no, nah, it ain't no dragon. It's an empire. Dragon step up. Big old foot. And since your mind is set so much on a dragon being an empire, your brain can't even calculate that this is what the most high God prophesied. So now you're looking like, oh, dang, the Bible ain't even real. The, the Japanese folks was real. They was talking about Godzilla. <coughs> Not even realizing. No, nah, that was the book said. The book said a dragon going to come. I'm telling you, this, Satan, he worked. The enemy works. In this, in this, in this place of uncertainty, making you certain about something that's uncertain, right? Or making you certain that the truth is not the truth because of something that you're uncertain about. We got to nail stuff down, right? What does it mean? How, why do I believe that? Sometimes you gotta ask yourself, why did I come to that conclusion? And would I have come to that conclusion if I wasn't taught it that way? And did when I was taught it that way, was I given to it? Was it given to me in the book? Did somebody show it to me and say, hey, look, this is what the scriptures say, and that's why I believed it? Or did they just tell me something? Right? You're going to see Josiah is about to fix all of that. 
the same stuff we deal with today, I say all this stuff because the same stuff we deal with today, this has been something that we had to struggle with with all our people. Right? Watch. This will do, watch Josiah fix these people up. I love Josiah, boy. Woo! Watch him fix these people up. This is uh this is a uh, second chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. Let's start back at the beginning. I just want y'all to see that he burnt these bones just like the scripture said he is gonna do. Most high God. Most high God always gonna be right. When Josiah was eight years old, when he began to reign, he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah. And walked in the ways of David his father, and declined mm -hmm. neither to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Baalim in his presence. And the images that were on high above them, he cut down. And the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and stowed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. <coughs> and he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so right, he did what now? He burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Right, that was according to the prophecy <laughs> that the man of God told Jeroboam when he spoke out to the... Uh, to the uh, altars. You remember Jeroboam when he heard him say it? He was like, man, get get that man. He stuck his hand out like this, and the Most High God shriveled his darn hand up and made it hard. You know what I'm saying? Man, a guy had to pray for him to bring his hand back to normal. Jeroboam didn't like that thing, but guess what? It happened no matter who liked it. And it don't, oh, it don't matter how you feel about what's happening. That's why I tell people, I ain't about to sit here and argue back and forth about somebody. I feel like the Bible is sexist. I don't care what you feel like. It's right. You got to adjust. What we do because of how I feel, God got to adjust what's right. He telling you this is the right thing to do. I don't care about how it make you feel. It's right. So now one of us got to either God got to adjust or I got to adjust. Somebody got to adjust. Somebody got to somebody got to, you know what I'm saying, compromise. It's going to be a long day before God, God compromise. You can try your luck if you want. Keep going. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their Maddox round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Az Azaliah, and Messiah, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord of uh, to the to repair the house of the Lord his God. Mm -hmm. and when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought unto the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and all of the remnant of Israel, and of all Judah and Benjamin. And they returned to Jerusalem and they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen and wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and mend the house. Even to the artifacts and builders gave they it to buy hewn stone and timber of for couplings and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully and the overseers of them were they had. And Obadiah, and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah, and Meshulam, the sons of Kohath, the sons of the Kohathites, to set it forward, and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instrument of music. Also, they were over the bearers of burdens, and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service. And of the Levites, there were scribes and officers and porters. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found a book of the law of Yahuwah given by Moses. Hilkiah, Hilkiah found what now? The book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. He found the book of the law of Yahuwah that was given by Moses. Right. So they looking around. They're trying to get things together. Look at the order that he did it. Josiah, the first thing he did is he took away the uncleanness. 
He looked at everything that was unclean and he took it away. Then the next thing he did, he said, let's fix up the temple. He don't know the scripture. The boy was eight years old. All he knew is I knew what my daddy, daddy was trying to do. I mean, I know what my daddy did and I knew what my granddaddy was trying to do. I knew my great dear granddaddy was a good man. I just want to do the right thing. Let me tear down some of this stuff. He didn't know he is fulfilling prophecy. He just think he's doing the right thing. He don't know the most high God is guiding him. He just think he's doing the right thing. <clears throat> he don't know the scripture. He don't know the particulars. He just think he's doing the right thing. Right? What do you know? Most high God lead him right to the book. Hilkiah, he stumble on it. While they fixing up the temple, Hilkiah find the whole book of the law that was given by Moses. Watch this. Man, I love this thing. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law at the house of Yahuwah, in the house of Yahuwah. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of Yahuwah and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers, into the hand of the workmen. And Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he Watch this. Words. It came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law. What happened? He ripped his clothes. He ripped his clothes off. Boy, boy, Why Shaphan, did he rip his clothes off? Them, them young boys like, hmm, what's this? they got this little book here. You know, what, what's they think book? it's something to play with. They don't know. They don't know the book. But they listen to it and they care. Watch what he did. He ripped the man, ripped his clothes off when he heard the law. These people be lying when they talk about they, they don't know no darn law. These boys teach us lies. They don't know the law. If you knew the law, you'd be ripping your darn clothes off. You know the stuff we in right now come from our captivity, come from us not following the darn law. Keep going. Watch this. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, and the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, go inquire of Yahuwah for me. And for Why would he do that? that? Left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. Watch it. Great is the wrath of Yahuwah that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of Yahuwah to do after all that is written in this book. Notice what he said. All that is written in this book. He ain't got no New Testament. He ain't got no Paul. He ain't got no Peter. He ain't got no Yahushua. He don't have none of that. But guess what? When he heard the law, he knew well enough that it meant all the words that are in this book. And he knew that he ought to rip his clothes off because he's in the very predicament that the law said he would be in. Watch it. He'll tell you. Yeah, like in uh, in his day, he, he he know about Israel being carried away captive. He, he know about all that stuff. They seen all of this stuff. So it's even more real to him because it's like, dang, that just happened a couple of years ago and Israel is gone now. They ju That just happened. And he just sent his three men to go collect money from all them boys, from all the places that they was at. Go back a couple verses. Where was that at? Because we skipped over that. A lot of people don't notice this stuff. He, the, the, the young boy is so wise and connected. The most I got is guiding this man. Right? He started at eight years old. And just start seeking God. He didn't know the scripture. The scripture was all he knew is what, what people was teaching him. And maybe they was teaching him right. Maybe it wasn't so right. But when he got his hands on the law. Oh, man. Go back a couple verses where it's going to tell you, he, you know, I'm saying, all the people he collected money from. It's going to say Israel and Judah and the Benjamites, all that. And when they had came to Hilkiah the priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim. And all look, of so look, he get, they gathered, the Levites gathered it 
of the hands of Manasseh and Ephraim. All these are northern kingdom. Watch this. Watch this. Let me show you. And Ephraim Watch this. Where is that? all of the remnant of Israel. Hold on. Watch <coughs> this. Right? So these are the northern kingdoms, right? What we got on the screen right here, northern kingdom. So we got Ephraim, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Asher, Gad, Naphtali, Manasseh. Now, like, watch what he say. That's all considered the northern tribes. Watch this. Gathered the hand and had gathered the hand, wait, had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel and all of Judah and Benjamin as they returned to Jerusalem. <clears throat> right? So all the remnant of Israel, right? Remember, Manasseh and Ephraim, especially Ephraim, were considered the heads of Israel. So you would consider, you would kind of talk about them as representative of all of Israel, talking about the, the, the northern tribes, right? So all the, head, all the hands of Israel and Judah and uh, Benjamin. So in other words, he's telling you this money by the Levites was collected of everybody. We know that the northern tribe, a lot of them were already out. They were already taken over. They were already taken and put into Babylon and put it into uh, Assyria. So they going out collecting or people are coming back and collecting this money. Right. If you read the books that's in the Apocrypha, you know that there were people that were exiled, but they still went back to Jerusalem. Right. They would visit in Jerusalem or they would go and meet their family in Jerusalem. So all this stuff is still in play. They collected money from all of these people. He knows that these people are not where they supposed to be. He probably listened to them complain. Right? During the feast, they probably come and visit. And he looking, when he hear the book of the law, he like, oh man, we way off. I thought I was doing something by taking off these, these, these out altars. Yeah, that's a good help, but we way off. He tore his darn clothes. Go back. Let's see. Let's keep going. And Hilkiah and they that <clears throat> and they that the king got appointed went to Huldah, the prophet's test, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tigva, Tigvath, the son of Har Harsha, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in, in the college and they spake to her to that effect. And she answered them. Thus says Yahuwah God of Israel. Tell ye the man that sent you to me. Thus says Yahuwah, behold, I will bring evil upon this place. And upon he said, the I'm going to look. Most high God ain't, man. Listen, you have to understand the most high God is not playing. He is not playing. He is not changing what he's going to say just because of how we feel or anything like that. He's not playing. The man just got done crying and ripping off his clothes. He's broken about what happened. Right. He's broken about what he heard in the law versus what he's seeing in reality. After that, he says, listen, y'all go find me a prophet. Go find me somebody who can communicate to God for me. Go do something. They go find, what's her name, Hilda? Hilda. Hilda. They go find Hilda, a prophetess. She, she, she dwelt, the book say the college, but it's talking about a community, right? So she dwelt in a community of people in, in uh, Judah, right? He go to her and then she said, yo, 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 this is what the most high God got to say. Hey, I'm going a, I'm to a whoop y'all darn butt. That's the first thing he said. He don't say, oh, well, you know, I'm happy you came. You're doing such a good job. Be encouraged. That's not what he said. The first thing out of his mouth. Read it again. Watch this. Thus says Yahuwah, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even the curses that are written in the book, which they read before the king of Judah. Right? I know you read the book. And I know you heard the curses and I know you can already see some of this stuff already happened, but I ain't done yet. Man, say even even the curses that they read before you, I ain't finished. Watch this, though. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. And as for you, and as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Yahuwah, so shall ye say unto him, thus says Yahuwah, God of Israel, concerning the word of God on earth. Because thine heart was tender, and thou did humble thyself before God, 
when thou heard his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humbled thyself before me, and did rip thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, says Yahuwah. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. Right? So you look at it, and the Most High God said, because your heart was tender, and you cried about this stuff, and you ripped your clothes, and you humbled yourself before me. Right? What does he mean by humble himself before him? Saw the self to speak up. Humble himself before him. Bow down, pray. He know. submitted to the word. Put himself and put himself under that under that rulership. He submitted himself to the word. That's it. He looked at it. He didn't know the most high God is right there. You didn't see nothing about him, him saying, Oh God, I know you standing here. Let me humble myself before you. That's not. No, what he did in action was he heard the word and he said, oh, man, we didn't messed up. We've messed up. Let me go try to make this right. He didn't look at it. Look, it's a lot of you have to be able to put yourself in the mindset. It's a lot of people that can handle that exact same situation a lot differently. There will, there will always be two ways. You will always try to, there, there's always going to be a, something in you that tries to justify yourself to look at, no, nah, I'm right because of X, Y, and Z. And another side, that's going to be looking to say, oh, no, I know I'm wrong. I'm guilty. Right? The key is to be doing that at the right time based off of correct information. He heard the information. And although he tore down all these altars <coughs> and he burned the bones of the priest, and uh, and all these different things that he did, right, to try to clean up Judah. Although he did those things, things that he should be proud of. You don't see nothing about him like, okay, well, you know, I'm doing the best I can. You know what I'm saying? Like, what else God want from me? Remember, they don't have everything we have. We have we have New Testament. We got all this stuff. We got we got a bunch of apostles that tried to explain all the prophets and all the law to us. Like, we have a lot of resources. He don't have all that. All he working down is, you know what I'm saying, people telling him this is what you should be doing, this is what you can't. A lot of stuff ain't even documented. He ain't got Bible. It ain't Bibles. He can't just go to everybody's house and there's a Bible there. They didn't have one. They didn't even know where it was. He's sitting there just like, man, I'm just doing the best I can. I'm using the information I got. But when he heard that law, he knew there's a gap. He didn't try to play around with it. He didn't try to make himself out to be like, you know what? I feel like I feel like I'm doing OK. He didn't say, well, you know, I, I was working off of the information that I had at the time. That wasn't his mindset. His mindset was, OK, we wrong. We messed up. He ripped his clothes. He crushed over that thing like, dang it, because you know what that tells you about him? Man, I was just trying to do this thing right. That's it. This whole time since eight years old, I've just been trying to do this thing right. And I don't have, look, I didn't have all the information and it breaks me to see the people, my people in this condition. And all I'm trying to do is get us right. I didn't have the information. I ain't blaming nobody for that. You know what I'm going to say? Man, somebody go see. Let's uh, go. Somebody find Hilda. I just need a word. Somebody just, you know what I'm saying? Go find her real quick. Hilda come out first thing. She say, oh, no, I'm deaf. Most I got, I'm Definitely going to do some evil to this place. Oh, I'm going to wear these boys out. Because they do, I mean, they doing the most. They sacrificing the idols and altars and all types. Of, let me tell you something. I'm going to wear these people out. But concerning Josiah the king. Oh, that boy heart was tender. He ripped his clothes and wept over what I was talking about in that law. When he saw that law, oh, man. That boy wept over it. The rest of y'all. Oh, I'm not even, I'm not even close to done. Everything that's written in that law, I'm going to put on y'all. I'm not even close to done. But I won't do it in Josiah's day. Right? He going to get to go and get collected to this father. He's not going to be able to see all this stuff that's about to happen. That's a blessing. Right? He did Hezekiah the same way. Remember, Hezekiah was like, well, listen, it works out for me. 
It ain't happened in my day because Hezekiah know most high God say something, it's gonna happen. So it, it only once he say this gonna happen, it don't even make sense to sit here and go back and forth like, oh well, you know what I'm saying, God, you know what I'm saying, please don't let it happen. That's not gonna happen. It's gonna happen now or it's gonna happen later. He already said it, so it's gonna happen. Right? Only thing I can ask for it, don't let it happen in my time. Hezekiah was happy with that. A lot of people look at that and they read it the wrong way, like, oh, look at Hezekiah, he's selfish. He's Christian boy. They mess up this book. No, he just got a better understanding of the word than you. How are we going to take counsel from people that don't understand the word? That's why I, ain't, I know I'm crazy. That's why I ain't never got a therapist. You know what I'm saying? What you, well, you don't know the word. What I'm going to say, you go tell me. How I'm going to listen to you tell me I'm crazy you don't even know the word? You got to know the word first. You're going to call me crazy. There's a lot of the reason why I have it with to seek a therapist. <laughs> yeah, like you, can't, you can't give me no, no mental guidance. You don't, even you don't even understand what the mental is. You get talking about my mental. We talking about soul now. How you know, how you know what soul is if you don't understand the word? You don't understand scripture. <coughs> when a man die, where his soul go? In the ground. Where his spirit go? Back to God. If you don't know that, if you don't know that basic, if you don't, listen, the life is in the what? Blood. What's life then? Soul. That got that. Your soul is in your blood. And you think you're giving me mental guidance. Please, you ain't even got no principles behind. You can't even stand it. You don't stand on this word. You can't tell me nothing about no mental. You mess around confused. That's why these kids out here killing themselves and doing the most now. They just released that, that uh that trans that the the trans, the tranny dude. You know what I'm saying? He shot up that, he shot up that uh that Christian school. You know what I'm saying? Like I think it might have been last year he shot it up. And he wrote he wrote some paperwork there. He wrote, you know what I'm saying? He wrote why he did it. And they didn't. You know what I'm saying? Them, them, uh, them Democrats didn't want to, you know what I'm saying? They didn't want to release that thing. <laughs> They're like, nah, that's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be Republicans shooting stuff up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's supposed to be the gun, these gun toting Republicans shooting stuff up. Right? He shot up that Christian school and he telling, he is like, oh man, I ain't like, you know what I'm saying? These white, these white men, you know what I'm saying? That, you know what I'm saying? They got these kids and these kids are, you know what I'm saying? It's that in the white man. And it's a white man himself. You know what I'm saying? But he changed himself to a girl. He thought he did, at least in his brain. Guess what? I bet you he had a therapist. I bet you he had a therapist, a counselor or two. He used to go to the school. He Christian can't guide a person? Can't make sense out of this stuff? You don't know the book? You know the book, you can look at a person and tell them something. You give them three times, like, okay, look, you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to tell you. They argue against you. Okay, this, this is what I'm trying to They argue against you. They tell you, okay, wash my hands. You good. You go on. You ain't trying to learn no word. You, don't try, you ain't trying to know no word. Your soul, you got to deal with your own soul. Most high God going to deal with your soul if you don't figure it out. Keep going. Let's see what the book says. <laughs> Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the hold king on, let's up. look at, hold on real quick. Sister Pamela said, is that how Yah, what does that say? Is that how Yah graced Josiah, the same as the time of tribu tribulation? Those of us who have humbled ourselves will not be tormented. Well, you know what I'm saying? It depends on what we mean by torment. We say, if we, if we mean tormented as in going to the, the lake of fire, um, to the everlasting torment, yeah, those who humble ourselves to the Most High God won't be tormented. But in terms of the tribulation, in terms of like the, the things that happen to the whole world, um, a lot of us will have to, you know what I'm saying, participate in some of that. You know what I'm saying? At least the way I read it, the way I read it, I think a lot of us will will have to participate in some of that. Not every, all of us. There will be some that will be protected. When we but if you home. when you look at when you look at um, grab uh, Ezekiel, what is it? Chapter eight. That's good. Let, let me see. I think it's Ezekiel chapter eight, verse one. It's been a while, but I want to say it's eight. If it ain't eight, it ain't twenty eight. So, yeah, I want to say it's eight. 
Maybe it's nine. If it ain't eight, try nine. I think it might be nine. Is that when God told Ezekiel to look through the look through the door and he saw all that wild stuff happening? Yeah, when he told him to put a mark on the people. Yeah, that's nine. That's nine. So give me Ezekiel chapter nine, verse one. Right, final answer. Yeah, I think you're right. It is nine. He also cried in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Right. He said, look, bring all the people near. Right. That got the destroying weapon in their hand. In other words, something that they can do some damage with. Tell them to come on by. We're going to get to this. We kind of fast forward, but I just want to use this to answer your question, Sister Pamela. All right. Watch this. Keep going. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was cloaked with linen, with a rider's mm -hmm. horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called the man clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side and the lord said unto him go throughout the midst of the city through the midst of jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof right so now there there was a man right a man that that was wearing linen and he had an inkhorn so in other words he had a, a instrument to write with you know what i'm saying in his hand right and the Most High God called him over and he said, yo, go on out there. Everybody who does what? Go through the city in the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. If you sigh Man. and you cry because of all the abominations that's done in Jerusalem, you get a mark. Keep going. Watch what happened. He going to mark you. Right. The word mark is, is this sign right here. This little thing the what we use as a logo. Right. This is this is the paleo Hebrew for for uh, that's translated here as the word mark. It's just look, if we looked at this in the Hebrew, you know, what I'm saying if we just looked at the Hebrew, we, we is reading the Hebrew version of this uh, scripture. All we would see there instead of the word mark was this. That's it. Right. So he's saying it's putting that Hebrew letter on you. That's what it's saying. Keep going. Watch this. And go to the others and to the others, he said in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. He said, don't touch anybody that got the mark, but start at my sanctuary. Right. So, yeah, there's going to be a level of torment that people who humble themselves to the most high God. And when we say humble, we got to look exactly at the examples that we look at. Josiah cried and tore his clothes when he heard the law. And these individuals here in this prophecy, they 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 cried and sighed, shaking their head like, oh, man, it's foolishness going on around here. Right. At the stuff that was happening in Judah. So the most high God put a mark on them and to make sure that they were excused. Just like Josiah, he said, listen, you ain't going to have to see this in your day. But he said, kill everybody else. And guess where you should start? You got to start at my sanctuary. You got to start at the temple. Right. This is how the most high God, this is how he works. So, yes, some of us who humble ourselves will be protected from some wrath. Right. But that wrath is going to be happening right around us. It's going to be happening right around us because it's going to start with us. And then it's going to work its way out. Let's go back. This is uh second Chronicles. Where we at? Uh, second Chronicles 34, 29. This is second Chronicles chapter 34. 
Verse Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of Yahuwah. <clears throat> and the king stood in his place and made a covenant before Yahuwah to walk after Yahuwah and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which was written in the in this book which are written in this book and he caused all that were present in jerusalem and benjamin to stand to it and the inhabitants of jerusalem did according to the covenant of god and god of their and the god of their fathers and josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertained to the children of israel and made all that were present in israel to serve even to serve yahuwah their god in all his days, they departed not from following Yahuwah, the God of their fathers. That's the end of the chapter? Yeah. All right. So we can stop there. We'll pick it up next week because we got a few, we got a few additional prophets that popped up. So we read a, a, just a little tiny bit of Isaiah. There's so much Isaiah that we haven't covered yet, but we read just a little tiny bit of Isaiah. We'll start to trickle in a lot of what Isaiah prophesied about. Uh, or at least a good portion of what Isaiah prophesied about is about to come up. So we'll touch on it in a little bit, um, just kind of going back. But at this point, Isaiah is already dead, right? And then we have Micah. Micah is gone as well. We read a little bit of Micah, um, but, you know, you also have Micah that was prophesying. So we got a few other prophets. You can see them up there. We got Nahum, um, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Joel, and Jeremiah. All of these prophets came up in the days of Josiah. What does it mean when you start seeing all these prophets pop up? Something bad about to happen. How do we know that? What prophet told us that already? It was it Amos? Yeah. Didn't Amos tell us Most High God ain't going to do nothing until he tell it to the prophets? Mm -hmm. Right? So when you start seeing all these prophets pack up, pop up, that means something going down. Right? You can kind of see it. The first time all them prophets start pop, popping up, what happened to Israel? Good. They got washed out, right? Most high guys, like, you know what I'm saying? It's like washing the dish and flipping that thing over. Right? That's what happened to them. Now, a bunch of prophets popping up, and we're going to see that the same thing going to happen to Judah. All right? Same thing is going to happen to Judah. So it's important. We're going to kind of look through it. To try to kind of try to try to figure out, you know, what I'm saying how this thing kind of plays out for us, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll kind of make some sense of it from there. All right, any questions? I give them time to respond in the chat here. But yeah, we'll probably, you know, what I'm saying it's a lot of profits, so we probably. You know what I'm saying? We'll kind of see how we tackle it. We'll probably do. I don't know. We'll we'll see how it come together. We'll see how it come together. All right. No questions. If you do got questions, of course you can always text. Now I feel like y'all don't text and call me no more. I don't know what happened. People used to text and call all the time. I used to complain. Maybe that's what I get for complaining. But now I miss it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Now nah, I miss somebody called me. You know what I'm saying? But no, if you got questions seriously, at any point, you could text and call. Uh, really text. You call, you probably just going to have to leave a message, and then I, I end up uh, uh, reaching back out to you. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can join us for our fellowship hour. Um, just reach out, um, and I'll, I'll get you the information to join. Um, or in, you know, in, in anything else, if you want to join our little community online. 
Um, you can join that as well. Uh, <laughs> hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, just reach out. Let us know. Uh, y'all bless. I appreciate y'all. Let's go ahead and pray out.